Angela Ive. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Once again, my dear friend Reese Rowan has written a new book. <laughs> I get to say that like at least twice a year, sometimes <laughs> this year, actually three times. Now, yeah. So, right? yeah. yeah. So, we had Amali in March. And now we have this um, wonderful book from Lake Union Press. And in November, on November 4th, Reese will be in Scottsdale with me at the Poison Pen talking about her royal spinus. So, it's a banner year. How are you, Reese? Um, well, I, I was just telling you earlier, I've been better. I've had plumbing today, an eye infection and stitches removed from my ankle. So, you know, apart from that, it's been a wonderful day. <laughs> when, when she says plumbing, she's talking about actual yeah, house yeah, plumbing. Actual, no, real plumbing, plumbing, yes. Plumbing. Yeah, no, 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 no. Too much information. No, we had a leak that flooded my office and I had to, we had to remove about a thousand books. So that was that was not the most fun thing we've done. No, but anyway, now you're here with me. Yeah, and yeah. We get to have a conversation. Yeah. So let me start out by saying that the Paris assignment, um, I know because I listened to Reese do a little talk, so I'm cheating here slightly. Yeah. The Paris assignment is not necessarily the title that you would have given this book, is it? It is. Um, I mean, I have to be quite honest. It isn't because, well, from it, for one thing, that's just one part of a long story that starts in 1930 in Paris, but it spans between Paris and London and Australia. And um, I actually wanted to call it Island of Lost Boys. What did you think of that? Well, I liked it. I thought yeah. the Lost Boys part was, yeah. um, I don't know, I don't think of Australia as an island. No, it's, more, <laughs> so. it's a big, a big island, yeah. Right. I, um, I, just wanted, I wanted an enigmatic title. And, you know, my publisher, of course, said Paris sells. We have to call it Paris. Well, yeah, I mean, a, lo it, a lot of it is to do with Paris. We do go to Paris during World War II, especially. And that's the sort of most tense part of the book. But um, there are so many pa Parises at the moment, you know, the Paris shoe and the Paris elbow and God knows. You know, else. we have had a table at the bookstore for like two or three years, which I determined to change up. That is all Paris books. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are so many books with Paris in the title and mm -hmm. there it sits and it keeps getting replenished you know, yeah. with new, yeah, no, new Paris people, books. For some reason, people love Paris and I can't, I mean, obviously it's a delightful city, but it has that sort of lure that you don't find in, say, if you had a table about Barcelona or Berlin. I mean, they're all interesting cities, but there's something about Paris, that sort of romance and, um, you know, the cobblestone streets and Hemingway and all. Yeah, that. I mean, there's it's literature, it's yeah. art, it's yeah. romance. But in the context of the war, you know, I mean, Paris was like yeah. occupied France and yeah. um, a, a kind of focus. Um, and as you say, your story is actually from 1930 to after the war. Mm -hmm. We end up in Australia. So yeah. the Paris part is, um, while it's a chunk of the book in a, yeah. but you point out the, the tense part, it's yeah. really not the story. So the, you meat is the meat in the middle. It's the meat in the middle of the story, I think. Yeah. Like a sandwich. Love it. <laughs> Great. Maybe like a like a sub. Uh, yeah. Anyway, right. yeah. um, I really I thought your character of Madeline was a really interesting one because you know you're very good on taking young English girls who have been protected and are suddenly cast into you know exotic locations like for example Paris or earlier Venice or yeah. whatever and yeah they're really untrained and unprepared but something about them yeah. um, makes them take hold they have some grit underneath all that oh yeah attention. that's the true the true boo true blue british uh, maybe something to do with going to a boarding school you know if you can survive those meals and those cold dorms and everything you can probably s survive most things but no i mean i i think the british character in those days anyway brought you were brought up to not make a fuss to get on to do your duty those things were rammed down your throat always you didn't you didn't complain you didn't whine i mean i think that was the, the amazing thing about britain during the war if you look at those photos of, of a bomb site with everything completely destroyed and in the middle of it a woman sitting there with a cup of tea in her hand that just sums it all up that we got on with it we didn't make a fuss um 
and and you know that that I think that was instilled into the British culture. I don't know if it's still there. I think we're a lot more um, wimpy these days, but um, a lot softer. No, I think yeah. that's true. But you know, there was there was not a lot of comfort in many aspects of British life still in the forty. You know, remember Jackie's parents living in a you know place where they had like an outdoor privy or whatever it was yeah. like to 1950. But I've always remembered in one of the Royal Spinus books, Georgie is actually with her ghastly sister-in-law um, yeah. up in the in the castle, yes. you know, up in Scotland where it's freezing cold and all the rest of it. And it reminds me of a line in um, Don't Let's Go to the Dogs at Night. You know, the I can't think of her name, but... Yeah. Um, writing about her Scottish parents who went to, was it Rwanda, I think, or Zimbabwe or something? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Alexandra, yeah. whatever her name. Anyway, um, and there's a point at which, you know, things are going all to hell. And, um, and she points out that at no point in their African adventure were they ever as uncomfortable as they had been being raised in Northern Scotland? Oh, yeah. And I, you know, and then I thought about your passage in whichever Royal Spinus. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that's really true that that, you know, you well, on the one hand, we tend to think of like Lord Peter or Mr. Campion and how elegant they were, yeah. and, you know, yeah. how pampered they were. But out in the country, they really weren't, were they? Oh, listen, when I watched Downton Abbey, I grew up in a big drafty house and I watched them sitting there at dinner with their backless dresses. And I think, no, you wouldn't have done that. You would have had your wrap on. It's freezing in those rooms. You know, I grew up in a house. We had no central heating of any sort. We had a fireplace in the main sitting room, which was 30 feet by 18. So it was pretty big. And um, we had a, a fireplace in the bedroom. Well, I didn't have a fire in my bedroom. My mother had a fire in her bedroom. There was a boiler in the kitchen. And apart from that, it was freezing. I mean, it was so cold, there would be ice on the inside of the windows. So I think most people in England in those days did grow up being pretty hardy. No kidding. I mean, you have to spend most of your time in the kitchen by the aga. Hoping oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, we did that, yeah. Yeah. Years and years ago, it was in the mid 80s when I was traveling in England by myself before I moved to Arizona, I met some very kind people and they sent me up to visit their daughter and son-in-law. And he had one of those palatial Scottish homes on the banks of Loch Lomond. Uh -huh. And it was like June the 5th. And I mean, it was in the 30s. It was seriously cold. And he had turned off the heat because that's what everybody did. They oh, turned oh, off so the heat on either the 1st of May or whatever. Oh. And I spent almost the entire time in the bathtub. I was so <laughs> cold. And the only thing I could do was constantly have hot baths. You know, fortunately, they hadn't oh. turned off the hot water heater. And okay. I thought to myself, you know, why? I mean, why? And I finally asked him and he said, well, that's just what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just like turn the heat off. Well, my father, my parents-in-law had, um, they moved away from their house in London and had a very nice bungalow built on the grounds of my sister-in-law's house. So right in the beautiful part of the country, modern bungalow with everything you could think of. And I would visit them and like in November or December and my father-in-law be saying, it's wonderful. We haven't had to turn on the central heating at all yet. And I'm wearing three pairs of tights, two undershirts, <laughs> and a scarf in the house. Got it. Well, anyway, Madeline, yeah. Madeline yeah. goes, yes. um, she's in school. And as I recall, in order to complete her degree in French studies, she is required to spend a term, whatever that was, yeah. yes. in Paris, right? Yes. So it's yes. 1930. Yeah. And there she is. Is it at the Sorbonne or is it a different school? No, it's at the Sorbonne itself. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there she meets a charismatic young Frenchman. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking. I was thinking the whole of this book hinges on. It's like you know Robert Frost, two roads diverge in a yellow wood. The whole of this book hinges on the tiniest of things. Yeah. And, and at the very beginning, she's in a lecture taking notes, and someone sits in the seat beside her and says, "What's this about?" And she says, "It's." It's Fedwa Racine, and he says, "Oh, boring, stupid old woman." And he says, "Do you want to go and get a cup of coffee?" And she says, well, I shouldn't. I'm in the middle of a lecture. And he says, come on. It, you know, I've got friends who took the same notes last year. And so she goes with him and her whole life changes because of that tiny little thing. Um, he warns her at the beginning. He's very charismatic. He says, you shouldn't fall in love with me. Um, and of course, she does. She and, 
yeah, interestingly too, he falls in love with her. So um, it's very nice, but um, uh, it, it does change her whole life because she makes decisions from then on that really change, change the whole direction of her life. Well, that's absolutely true. I was interested that he is a communist. Uh, because yeah. in 1930, there was, you know, there was a huge attraction, wasn't it, to all kinds oh, of European yeah. and English intellectuals. Yes. Um, communism in the most pure sense of it. I mean, if they stopped to think what was going on with, with Stalin, um, they wouldn't be very happy. Um, and, and exactly what had happened in Russia altogether, they wouldn't be. But that idea that, especially because he's grown up with, with quite a lot of wealth himself, you know, his mother lives in a chateau. Um, so these sort of people thought, well, why shouldn't everything be shared more equally? And, you know, I totally agree with them, except it never works because some people are always more equal than others, as Orwell said. But um, no, he's an idealist, an idealist and um, uh, great energy, great um, charisma. So he, he's um, someone I'd like to have met. Well, she never had a chance, no question about it. Um, yeah. And when her semester is open, she goes back home. But also, let's keep in mind that her family really isn't one that you'd want to go home and spend time no, with. No. So it made it easier for her to say, you know, I'll, I'm will i going to return to Paris and see what happens. Yeah, I think so. Her mother, her mother was half French. And so she grew up speaking French, which is why it's easy for her to come to the Sorbonne for that one term. Uh, but her mother had died in the Spanish flu in 1920. And the father, obviously, like many men, wanted to be looked after and had married again very quickly um, a, a woman who's lost her own husband in the Great War and would like to be provided for. So it works very well for both of them, except she is not a warm and loving woman who could be a mother. And she gets rid of Madeline as quickly as possible, sending her to boarding school, makes her feel very unwelcome at home. And uh, her father is one of these unworldly people. He reminds me a lot of um, Mr. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. He'd much rather sit alone in his study and read his books, even though chaos is going on around him. And so, you know, he's he's never been supported. He's never said to his wife, don't speak to Madeline like that, um, which he should have done. So she's not very happy at home. She doesn't feel loved or welcomed at home. And so to find someone who loves her somewhere else is a huge um, is a huge attraction. Well, it is. Plus, she has an aunt in Paris, so that's another thing. But you know what? You're really good at writing dreadful women. Isn't that all? I mean, yeah. If you if someone writes their PhD thesis on my books, they're going to have the same things. They're going to have these these naive English girls, and they're going to have these awful, spiteful, cold women. And I, you know, I had I had a lovely mother and a lovely grandmother, so I don't know where they came from. I've known you forever and you're you're not even a little spiteful. So no. you know, I, I find it interesting that you write these people and their dialogue, which is really yeah. wicked, so mm -hmm. easily. You know, are you channeling something? I must be channeling somebody. I mean, I, I I can't think of anybody. I mean, I grew up, I went to a school that was all um older spinsters, clearly of the age who'd lost their own chance for marriage in the first world war because they were like 60 when I knew them. And they were all very spiteful and very bitter and very old. And the fact that we had a life ahead of us that could be wonderful. And they would say the most horrible cutting things all the time. So I think, you know, maybe maybe I'm channeling them because they, they were really rather nasty. Yeah, but you know, that whole last generation was was a terrible tragedy for those women who were yeah. brought up, you know, to like anybody, you know, brought up to hope for families and, you know, yeah, yeah. things. And then well, the war they, just decimated their chances. They only had one in ten chances of marrying if you were born in the right age for that. My my aunt was like that. My I had a my mother's oldest sister was um uh she never married and she was she was lovely. She was my fairy godmother who'd whisk me away and do exciting things with me, take me to Europe, you know. She appears in the books too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, in any case, Madeline back to Paris and yes. meets yeah. her meets her aunt, who yeah. Um, yeah. is yeah. a complicated person and a complicated relationship, but it does give Madeline sort of a start. And eventually, as you point out, um, she and Gilles um well, it's not a big spoiler to say that Madeline gets pregnant, not really having yeah. any clue about how all that works. 
And yeah. at that point, Gilles does decide that they should get married. Yeah. He, well, he defies his family um, right. and marries her, does the right thing and, and marries her. And they have a very happy life. You know, they don't have that much money, but um, they have a happy relationship. They have a wonderful little son called Olivier and everything's going swimmingly in Paris until the Germans walk in. Yeah. And then he sends her back to London with their son to be safe. And she knows very well that being, being Gilles, he's going to go and join the resistance. So she's in London where she finds out that it's not safe and um, finds herself alone in London and takes the tremendous chance to go and volunteer to be dropped behind enemy lines in Paris. Don't want to, Which, say, any, don't want to say any more about that. There's no, a, lot, no. a lot of spoilers in this book. No, but, you know, we all know that the yeah. people who are dropped behind enemy lines in France had a very, very low chance of survival. Um, yeah. So it, was, it wasn't quite a suicide mission, but it certainly could have yeah. been. I find, it, I find it interesting that people went to London because London was the one place in England for sure that you were not safe if you'd gone to like York or, yeah. you know, Northumberland yeah. or somewhere. Somerset, you yeah, you did fine. Yeah, yeah, yes. But um, no, it, you're saying about the chances of survival. The statistics say that 25% survival rate so 75% of those young women knew that they probably were not going to survive. And they also knew if they were going to be captured, what lay ahead for them. I mean, it, interestingly, they were when they were uh, trained and equipped, they were given a jacket on which one of the buttons was a, a cyanide pill. Um, so that if they were captured, they could take the easy way out then. Um, unfortunately, they get Madeline when she doesn't have her jacket with her, which was, uh, but well, fortunately, because she does survive. But um, uh, it just, the, I think writing this, and I, I had, I went through their training manual. So everything you see that they do there, they really did. Such incredible bravery. I mean, these are ordinary young girls who, you know, have had very, one of them, Portia, has had a very upper class life and has done, been skiing in Switzerland and things. One of them's had a very lower class life. They bond so well with each other and they're such, they're such great support to each other. And yet they're in no way would you say, oh, these are heroic young women. They're just, they're uh, against all odds they're doing this. And I found that amazing for them. I was so proud of them. Absolutely true. I think I'm trying to remember, wasn't it Susan Elia McNeil that wrote a book about about this too, about women trained in yes, Scotland? Yeah, yes, in Scotland, essay, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but I mean, and presumably it was mostly women because the men had all gone into the military. Um, or most of them were yeah, actually I mean, serving in the army, so they weren't available to be dropped behind yeah. lines and prints. Unless they'd volunteered for this when they were called up. You know, yeah. some of them might, you know, some of them who when you were called up, if you had sort of special skills, if you had like good languages or you had great mathematical skills or something, they, they would use you not just in the military. They would find find a way to use you in secret service somehow. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And so I've got some men who are being trained at the same time as them. And to start with, the men take it for granted. Well, when they walk into the room, the first thing one of the men says, oh, good, help has arrived. Now you can go and make us a cup of tea, dear. And um, uh, they point out that, no, they're not going to make the cup of tea. They're, they're fellow trainees. And, and as they train, they prove that they're equal to the men. And it's equal, when they're sent on these like obstacle courses, they actually do better than the men because they help each other. You know, there's one time when they, one of them climbs to the top of a, a wall and helps the others over and the other stands in the middle of a stream and helps the others across. And I think that, you know, I wanted to show in this how strong a bond between females can be a wonderful thing. Absolutely true. I mean, I was thinking too that the survival rate for the young men in the RAF was really terrible also. Yeah, you know, six, so. weeks, six weeks in a bomber, yeah. Yeah, right. So it's, you know, it's just, I think about, the, you can't help but think about the Ukrainians reading this book, you know, yeah, for yeah. the similarity. And you also can't help but think that the Russians have taken the Nazi playbook. And, mm -hmm. you know, because the brutality of the Nazis was so extraordinary, but mm -hmm. it appears to be similar. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, so your book has a lot of contemporary relevance, given the situation that we're in again, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, again, I think when you write about World War II, which I've done quite a lot now, um, 
it's the last time you have that clear feeling of good versus evil. You know, every conflict since then has been tinged with shades of gray. Should we be doing this? Shouldn't we? But that was so clear in everybody's mind that everybody felt if I don't do my part, evil will win. And so, you know, people volunteered. They they signed up to do amazing things, really. I mean, to train to be in a bomber, knowing you could be shot down any minute, to be in a fighter plane, having these dual battles over the channel all the time. They, people were amazing. And um, well, even the even in London, like the firefighters who rushed into a, a bombed building to rescue people, everybody didn't think of themselves first. And I think it's quite I think it's what you've got in Ukraine now. You've got people who are, you know, volunteering, flinging themselves into the fight because it's their country and they care about it. And they were invaded. You know, I mean, yeah. they didn't yeah. know where they asked for. I was actually looking at an historical novel um, yesterday called the embroidered book, I think it is. But anyway, um, detailing what happened to the children of Maria Theresa, nothing good for almost all of them. Mm -hmm. But the daughter of Charlotte, who was the queen of Naples, ruminates about, about Napoleon because he was actually, in his time, just as ruthless as Hitler. You know, I mean, oh, he was oh, standing out and, yeah. you know, invading countries where, yeah. Yeah. you know, there was no reason for it. And yeah. once again, hubris pushed him, you know, to the point where eventually people bonded together and fought back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's that same, it's that same thing. It's the Hitler, Putin, Napoleon, you know, and I'm sure there have been lots before them where they just... I mean, we don't have too many records about Alexander the Great, but, you know, there's this this ethos that seems to overtake some of these guys where, regardless of the human cost, they are determined to, you know, plunge well, that, everybody uh, into disaster. That's the actual point, is that probably 10% of the people in Germany thought that it was a good idea. The same yeah. as I'm sure 10% of the people in Russia think it's a good idea. And when you're called up into the army... You can't say, no, I'm not doing it, unless you're a conscientious objector, and then you're treated really badly. And probably in Russia, you're going to fall out of a window. But um, uh, so, you know, it, it is. It's one man's twisted vision that completely devours a whole country. And, and you have to understand, what is it? I mean, what is it in somebody that wants to make them conquer the world? I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible to me. Well, to me, too. But um, it seems to be a recurring drama. <laughs> Out and here we are again. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's yeah. move on from the war. And yes. Reese, um, Reese has spent part of her life in Australia. Mm -hmm. So we moved to um, another continent, which was not actually invaded. They did a lot of service in Australia in both wars, actually, mm -hmm. and also New Zealand. But yeah. the, the war was not fought in Australia, although it could have been because the Japanese got. I guess up around the north, it was a they, lot of fear of Japanese invasion. They did actually come as far as bombing Darwin, the Japanese. Did they? Yeah, so Darwin was completely destroyed by Japanese bombs. In those days, it was just a very small town. So not much is known about that. But yeah, the Japanese came very close to invading yeah. the very north. It wouldn't have done them much good because, you know, Australia is so large and that northern territory is so remote and so bleak, you know, they would have captured like 500 people and then had a thousand miles before they got to anybody else. So it wouldn't have been worth much. But um, no, I mean, uh, and there was the Battle of the Coral Sea. So it was a, right. a, a ship battle, but um, uh, Australia itself was spared and of course, had enough food and everything. I mean, that's the one thing that our heroine notices when she goes to Australia is what people eat. Yeah. You know, in, in England, people were pretty much starving when, by the end of the war. And then that time after the war, I think that's one of the things interesting is the war came to an end and everybody in England thought, oh, good, we've been very good. We fought the war. Now it's over. And of course, rationing continued, so, um, shortages of everything continued, lots of shortage of fuel. You know, it was a cold winter and you couldn't get coal. So people were still suffering. And I think lots of people, that's why the um, socialists got in, because it's like, we fought this war, we won. Why, why are we not being able to eat any meat yet? So when a herring goes to Australia and they give her for breakfast steak and eggs, I mean, that, I have to say, when I first went to Australia, that shook me. If you go out of Sydney 
and you go and you stay in a country hotel anywhere, breakfast in those days was steak and eggs. Huge piece of steak and eggs for breakfast. Um, so well, it's not a full English, but um, no, that no, would. Yeah, was, actually, I was in Australia and I'm trying to remember when Susan graduated. My younger daughter, for her graduation, I had told each of my girls that I would give them when they graduated my school that I would take them on a trip wherever they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Susan spoke up, you know, Susan, so this one yeah. has a pleasure. Susan yeah. spoke up and said she wanted to go to the beach. And I thought, well, fine, you know, we'll go to the Caribbean, you know, yeah, yeah, Hawaii, whatever. Yeah. No, the beach was the great coral reef. That's the beach that she oh. had in mind. So I found myself going to Australia. And it would have been, I think, in the, trying to think, the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Right. It was shortly after I opened the bookstore in 1989 because Rob, Rob was able to run the store for three weeks or something, which would have been impossible today. Anyway, um, it was like going back to America in the 1950s. Yeah. The little, you know, the little motels and the whole, yeah. once you're outside of the city, as you say, once you're outside of Sydney or Brisbane, it was very much like rural America um, back in the 50s, the roads, the accommodations, yeah. the restaurants, the food, yeah. the whole thing, you know, I felt like I was in a time warp. Yeah, I actually spent, I, I stopped in Cairns once. There was one flight that Qantas was offering, probably in the late 80s, um, that went, you could go Cairns and have a stopover and then fly on down to Sydney, which is where I was going. Um, so I spent a few days in Cairns, went out to the Barrier Reef. And I stayed at this little motel called the Linga Longa. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was really primitive. And I had dinner and I had most beautiful fried shrimp. I mean, these huge prawns. And they were served with boiled cabbage and mashed potatoes. <laughs> and the dessert was jello and custard. So it was just like stepping back to school, you know. And um, when I went from this motel, everybody came and stood outside and waved from the taxi as I went. It was, so it was very sweet. It was. You could, in Cairns too, you could stroll across the street. And any car that was coming would just stop and let you finish strolling across the street. It was it was completely stepping back in time. So yeah, it really yeah, was. Yeah. And you know, you could you could easily, you know, snorkel away over mm -hmm. the great berry. By the way, I'm, I'm gonna put in a plug by chance. We were looking for something else. We watched this got to the Smithsonian channel the other night, which you can also reach via Hulu. And Sir David Attenborough has done a beautiful photographic documentary of the Great Barrier Reef when he actually goes down in a submersible. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, the, the photography is absolutely extraordinary, but he does um, a really good job with the whole origin of the reef and the problems that are ensuing. And, you know, I just can't recommend it enough. I know it's a complete detour here from what we're talking <laughs> about, but I was, I was so impressed. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I was also thinking he's got to be, he's certainly a senior by now. And he oh. has that wonderful kind of British obliviousness to like ever getting his hair cut yeah. or what he's wearing. So he has all this white hair blowing in the wind. And you know, he, No, he must be over 90 by now because, yeah, I, he, he, because I remember when I was growing up, the Attenborough brothers were sort of fa famous already. So, yes. Yeah. Well, and I said to Rob, whatever his age, which is clearly going to be at least 80 plus, I didn't look it all up. I had to really admire him because, I mean, he's getting into a submersible. He's leaping into a helicopter he's yeah, seen yeah. Her, he's i mean good for him you know it was just well, a fabulous beautiful. life right i mean he's he's yeah. done exactly what he wants to with his life he yeah. is but but i was i mean his sense of adventure and his sturdiness really come across and he's he's really beautifully spoken you know, mm -hmm. his narration and what he's talking yeah. about is wonderful. But anyway, yeah. back to Australia. So yeah. you said Madeline at the end of the war makes her way to Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a spoiler. We know she, she yeah. survived the war. Yeah. Anyway, Sorry. She, yeah well, yeah, she survived the war. So she makes her way to Australia with a mission. And I don't know if it's a spoiler really to tell you what the mission Probably. is. Probably. Probably. Yeah. I wouldn't do yeah. that. I would just yeah. say that yeah. it's really interesting, you know, to um, so much of World War II stories are really European centered or oftentimes Japan and Asia. But, you know, there aren't many forays into post-war Australia. Oh, no. So I found that to be really yeah. interesting. And there's some without making a spoiler, there's some parallels between what was going on 
in post-war Australia and, and what Reese was looking about and what had gone on in Ireland. And also, if you're watching um, not Yellowstone, but 1923 or whatever, mm -hmm. um, out of the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of behavior yeah. was not yeah. just relegated to Australia. No, no, it's real. And um, so, so a lot of a lot of Australia, I've set it this time in a, one of my favorite places, which is the Blue Mountains, because mm -hmm. the first time I went to the Blue Mountains, that was one of those places that took my breath away. And the interesting thing about the Blue Mountains is that they don't go up, they go down. When the first settlers, no, when the first settlers came to Australia, they kept trying to find a route across the Blue Mountains and they always perished or came back. And it turns out that there is no route through the valleys of the Blue Mountains. You have to go over the top. So you have to find a route that gradually climbs up and then finds a way across and then down the other side. So you're actually on top of these mountains when you get to Katoomba, the, the train climbs up very, very slowly. And you get up to Katoomba and this lovely fresh air and all the smell of the gum trees and everything. And then when you go out and look at the three sisters, go out and look at the, uh, the, the viewpoint, suddenly the, the ground just plunges away for a thousand feet below you. And you're wow. looking down at these sheer sides of a valley and complete silence. You know, you're looking down and the silence sort of comes up to. We had an interesting, when John and I um, were engaged in Australia, we were driving down to see his cousin and we were driving down to Melbourne and we had this little Volkswagen and we decided we'd camp the night on the way down. So we pulled into this place on the Blue Mountains and we, we, we slept for the night. And in the morning I got up and I was gonna go and find the nearest loo and I opened the door and I said to John, John, there was a large drop about five feet from us that we hadn't seen the night before. So, yes, it, it's like that all over. So it's, it's fascinating scenery. Oh, yeah, I think, I think Australia is amazing. I rented a car when I was in Sydney with Susan on the same trip. Mm -hmm. And we actually drove out to the Blue Mountains now, mm -hmm. you know, you're on the wrong side of the road if you're an American and all yeah. the rest of it. But um, it, yeah. it was exciting. But um, I love Melbourne and the area around Melbourne and mm -hmm. South. You know, there I've yeah. been to see the koalas and the burrowing penguins and all oh, the yeah. I have a nephew that lives in Melbourne and yeah. his his children are there and so forth. And I love Melbourne. It reminds me of Evanston. Yeah. <laughs> well, my my parents used to live in Eden, which is on the coast just north of um, on the border of New South Wales and, and Victoria. Okay. And, uh, so a beautiful big bay with all these lovely trees around it, and you could you. My father would get most annoyed if we if we we went to a beach and someone else was on it. He'd say, "Let's drive on." He you expected to have his own beach always, so um, they had a very nice time there. I bet. Well, Carrie Greenwood's wonderful Miss Fisher books are set yeah. in, in Melbourne, Melbourne. and um, yeah. you know Sulari Sulari Gentle, whom yeah. you know my wonderful yeah. author who has a new yes. book next year lives in the Blue Mountains and yeah. um, oh. she has set, but her books, if I recall, are really Sydney-based, you know, country around Sydney. They're not really yeah. down around Melbourne. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't, doesn't she have, I mean, they're out, the, his, his family home's out in the country somewhere, isn't it? But yeah, but I don't yeah. think it's, I yeah. don't think it's near Melbourne. There is one that is really like a Western the third one, yeah, I think, yeah. of the Roland Sims yeah. books. And yeah. I'm not sure exactly where that, that you know, that ranch is. But mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of the things that Attenborough does show in the Great Barrier Reef is some of the um, Native Australians, you know, that they've been there for 50,000 years. I think mm -hmm. they're the oldest mm -hmm. uh, culture whatever yeah, yeah. you want to call it. Yeah. And they have a memory of how the reef was formed, which they oh, perform yeah. in dance, which is oh, yeah. Really yeah. interesting. So yeah. Australia is the youngest of the of the continents and yeah. um, a lot of interesting. Anyway, that's where um, that's where your story ends up. Ends you know? up and ends up with a, a lot of hope, which I think is nice. Um, you know, it's such a bleak story and it was hard to write because I knew that bad things were going to happen to quite a few of the characters. And um, uh, so, someone who, who was one of the early readers of the book said, how could you let that happen? And I said, well, you know, it wouldn't be true to World War II if you didn't have things happening like this. People didn't survive against all odds often. Yeah. Uh, and so 
you know, some there are some really sad and some bad things in it, but um, two things that come through is the resilience of the characters to survive at the darkest moments against all odds. And that, that's true for two of the main characters. And then um, uh, the fact that, you know, people could look forward after the war and the, there was hope at the end of the book. Didn't you write one of your books, I'm trying to remember, about a, a young woman who ends up out in the in the country and has to cope with all the wartime shortages and there's a spy, a sort of a spy element to yeah, it? Yeah, 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 that, that was- um, What is that? That was this one, Where the Sky Begins. There it is. Yeah, she, she's born <laughs> out of her house and she she's uh, evacuated to the country. That's it. She's right. injured and has to learn to survive in the country. Yeah, and there's a spy and all. Well, there is, but I thought yeah. that was one of the more graphic depictions um, of just how how the shortages, yeah. how terrible they were, and what yeah. ingenuity it took for people to try to even feed yeah. themselves. Oh yeah, how hard yeah. that was. And you know that was a lesson that we obviously didn't learn when the pandemic struck. When you stretch your supply lines as far as England did, you know where everything is imported. Um, yeah. When something goes wrong, you really are hung out to dry. And that's, that's that so true. Is, yeah. Because England had a great communication system throughout the Commonwealth. I mean, that was we traded with the Commonwealth. So right. meat, meat came from Australia and New Zealand, and sugar came from Barbados. And that's we right. said, you know, so it worked wonderfully until you couldn't have transportation anymore. And that's then right. you had a, an, an island to, to feed, and, and a lot of people who lived in London. And um, uh, and how did you feed them? Well, you couldn't. You'd moved from a largely agrarian economy to an industrial economy. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there wasn't, you know, there wasn't enough um, agrarian left to support the whole population. And of oh. course, the real food stuffs had to go to the, the fighting people and all. So the left, mm -hmm. I still remember Robert Harris's book about um, Bletchley. Yeah, in, in England, Nima, yeah. right, very, which, very which I thought was brilliant. But I still yeah. remember how he talked about how everybody was gray and all because soap was almost impossible to come by. So people were more or less dirty all the time. There was, <laughs> Probably. There wasn't dry cleaning, you know, no, and, no, no. and people smelled and, you know, yeah. and teeth yeah. went bad because there wasn't enough in the way of milk and calcium and so forth. Oh, um, yeah. You know, the civilian population, even people who didn't actually serve or die um, on the in the, you know, spire military ranks, they really suffered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you were your Russian at one time was a quarter of a pound of meat per person per week. So that would be good. if there's four of you in the family, that's good. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you had four people, you could get a pound of meat per week. And it was if it was stewing meat, you could make a great big stew, maybe. But yeah. People had a tremendous amount of vegetables. Um, we did. And lucky people out in the country maybe had chickens. You know, yeah. so they, yeah, they wanted we, we, kept, we kept chickens at one stage, but the rats kept stealing their eggs. So that was very annoying. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about this. No problem. Your Zoom. Call you back later. Sorry about that. We can cut no that problem. out. <laughs> I, usually, I usually turn mine off, but well, I thought I thought I'd, I thought I'd turned it off, but obviously I right. It yeah. happens. Yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, I thought yeah. where the sky begins was really um, an excellent companion to Enigma. If you read mm -hmm. them together, you yeah. could recognize yeah. that the civilian and and again, I think about the Ukrainians. You know, what basic things are they? Things we take for granted. You know, mm -hmm. what things are they having to do without? Is yeah. Bombing happens and shortages happen. And, you know, the whole question of food, I think, is going to become acute is so much of the agrarian country in Iran, for example, and is no longer arable because there's no water. And I can't help but feel that Putin's grain embargo is going to backfire on him because there are going to be people who are seriously hungry mm -hmm. that um, are going to are going to really resist the idea that the Ukrainians can't export their grain. It's hard to live through a war. You know what? We can talk yeah. about World War II all day because we know how it came out. In the same way that Regency fiction, you know, everybody goes, you know, what a wonderful time it was and all we forget. 
that, you know, there was this 20 year war going on. And I don't know, I hope, I hope that this one doesn't drag on a lot longer. And, you know, we can look back on it. But when it's going on, and you don't know how it's going to come out, mm -hmm. and people are making sacrifices and dying, and things are being destroyed, it's really difficult to, you know, well, and, you know, I was thinking the other day, we just took it for granted that our lives were so smooth these days that yep. we'll, we'll plan oh next year next year well why don't we go so and so next year that sounds great yeah and then we'll take that cruise the year after that and then suddenly there's a pandemic and we can't go anywhere and suddenly there's a war and who knows and then suddenly the chinese are being very aggressive and uh, you're not safe anymore and you so oh. you certainly feel that well, in the climate change thing, I was saying to Rob today, I went out to try to resurrect our orange tree, which is looking really pathetic. And, you know, I grew up in the Midwest where everybody had lawns. And I can remember, I can remember the sprinklers going like all the time because mm -hmm. water was a resource. Nobody even thought about it. You know, it was like yeah. you were around Chicago near Lake Michigan. You had like an infinite supply yeah. of water. And yeah. now, you know, they just passed a law here in Scottsdale that no new homes can have grapes at all. That's and I think idea. they're going to probably at some point either price water so high that people can't afford grass or they're going to make it retroactive and get rid of yeah. lawns because there just isn't enough water to support it. And what about the golf clubs? I mean, they're huge users of... of well, they, they recycle their water. They're actually pretty smart. And I know I my brother know. was chairman of the golf committee at Paradise Valley Country Club for a while. And yeah. they had to take out um, trees and they had to do a whole lot of things to make it um, much more, you know, th to reduce the water consumption. But they do a tremendous amount of recycling. We would have less trouble here if anyone had thought about water conservation mm -hmm. this is a real digression here but personally i think as we have all these golf courses and parks and um, flood zones and all that if we were to put water catchment tanks and so forth underneath them mm -hmm. because the problem we have here is the ground so hard when it rains the water all just runs away and goes down mm -hmm. to the old salt you know the great salt yes. river yeah. we don't keep it and yeah. if we kept it, we would yeah. have a lot less trouble. But yeah. nobody thought about that when they were. It's like Houston. Houston has built over all its national drainage. So yeah. in, in it's, it you floods. know. So it floods. Yeah, we That's right. That. And yeah. it's too rapid development. And I saw today in the Washington Post that New Orleans sea defenses are rapidly crumbling because yeah. the, the water level is rising much faster than anybody thought it was going to rise in the Gulf. Yeah. So. You know, there nobody really wants to do the tough stuff until it becomes really tough. Yeah. And you know, we just take things for granted, as you say, and rock yeah. along thinking it'll all be fine, and and then it isn't. Anyway, yours is a great book um, to read. It um, yeah. it's a different experience of the run up to the war and the war. And um, there is, as Reese says, a proliferation of books about Paris and war books. Mm -hmm. um, but this one is is out of the ordinary way. So, yeah. Do we have any questions? Or is well, I was just going to call Jacob up. Right. Yeah. He's got all that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if he's still surviving the heat. Yeah. There he is. Right. Jacob. Hey. So we have a few questions, Reese. Yes. Uh, this one's from Susan. Uh, do you plan on writing any more Constable uh, Evans books? Um. Interesting question. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed Constable Evan. I put him on one side when they took some of those books out of print. Now they're all as ebooks, so they are all ar around and they've actually reprinted them all in England. Um, and this, we've been going on about doing a TV series. It's been, um, have we got the funding? No, we haven't got the funding, but we might get the funding. So it's one of those things that may well happen. Um, the, the guy who's, who's pushing it is the writer for Doc Martin and for, and for New Tricks. So he's a good writer, so he'd do a good job. Um, it's just a question of getting funding together. But um, uh, if, if uh, the TV series came out, then I might be very tempted to write some more because I really miss him. I want to know what he's doing and Bronwyn and all those people. So I might be happy to go back to him. Jill asks, how many books have you actually written? I haven't counted how many I've read. Um, I, adult Mysteries, I've written, I think it's 53 now. Or 
mysteries plus historicals, yes. Um, do you enjoy writing with your daughter? I, I would imagine you do. But um, it's it, not it, going to say no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hate her. No, no. Um, it's 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 been a great joy. You know, she came to me. I had to put the Molly Murphy series on hold because, frankly, I couldn't do three books a year. Because, as you know, one of these big historicals requires loads of research, and they're quite long books. Um, she came to me a couple of years ago, and she says, "You keep getting all these emails saying when's there going to be another Molly book? I think I'd like to do the series with you." And I said, "Okay, well." Um, give it a try. I wasn't quite sure. I mean, I knew she was a good writer, but I thought, well, what if this doesn't work? Um, but I was, I, I was amazed how little handholding I had to do. She did the research. She read all 17 of the books and she came in with Molly's voice, just perfect. She had great ideas for plots. And I, with each book, I've been stepping back a bit. And we're now in the middle of one about the very early days of the movie industry. Um, which is fascinating. And she's found out all these interesting things that you just wouldn't believe. And so we've got, um, uh, we've got sort of very dangerous things happening uh, as because they would shoot things. They would shoot a scene with a, a real train and they wouldn't actually tell the train company they were going to shoot it. So they might have someone tied to the tracks and leap them up just before the train came and things and the passengers on the train staring out in absolute horror. Um, so lots of fun things, but she's done all this and she's come up with the plot and I'm just the... I'm just there in the background saying we need to, you know, this is a scene where we need to see more of so-and-so, so I'll handle that. But um, it's great. And she's got great ideas for her own series now. So I'm excited for her future career. Oh, that's wonderful. Is there yeah. going to be a Molly in the spring? Yeah, there is. It's coming out in, in, in March. So we will see you in March. And it takes place in the Catskills. It's the very early days of the Jewish bungalow communities. And um, uh, also the very early days of a state park and environmental concerns. And uh, so it's got lots of little threads going through it and, uh, and, and, and a very good, very good story too. Excellent. Wow, yeah. I'm really yeah. excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. The Borscht circuit at the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, it's that very early, you know, when um, when uh, Jewish people were not welcome at the big resorts. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, local far Jewish farmers in, in that area put little cabins up and said, come to us for the summer. So families would come up and stay there for the whole summer and the husband would go back and work and just come up for weekends. And um, that was how the whole thing started. And in my book, there's a man who has an idea to put up a hotel. So who knows? <laughs> Well, I, my, my very good friend of over 40 years in, in New York, she was my uh, she was the one I, who vetted everything that I did with this. And I was saying, you know, so I need to. She says, well, I do know Grossinger's grandson, if that's any help. Like, well, yes, it would be. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's, well, well yeah. that's something to really look forward to. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. So we get Reese on November 4th yeah. and then we will get Reese and Claire. Yeah. It's yeah. called In Sunshine or In Shadow. Is what oh, it's good called. title. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Any more? Any more? Uh, uh, yeah, there's a few. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Fletcher says, I've enjoyed your allusions to some great art in your stories. What's your inspiration for that? Are you an art geek yourself? Um, yes. Um, I, I, I paint watercolor myself, not nearly as well as I'd like to, but I do. Um, whenever I go on trips, I take my sketchbook. I am a huge, huge fan of the Impressionists. I will, uh, I was, uh, I will just stand and stare at, um, at Monet's pictures for hours whenever I get a chance. I was in Giverny last fall, um, and um, so yeah, I, I I love my art in in all forms. I think uh, if ever I'm in a uh, if ever I'm in a, a city, the first thing I do is head for the art museum. Monica Scully asks, what was your inspiration for the Royal Spinus series? Well, it's a good question. Um, it, was, it was sort of a backhanded one. I was, I was writing the Molly Murphy series and they were doing nicely. And my publisher said to me, we can't really break you out unless you do us a very big, dark, standalone novel. So I seriously thought about, you know, um, serial killers and terrorists poisoning the water supply. And then I thought, do I want to spend six months in darkness? No, I don't. So I thought, what would be my, the most unlikely heroine I could think of? How about if, how about if she was royal? 
but she was penniless. And it was the 1930s and it was that wonderful time of Mrs. Simpson and Noel Coward. And it was that poise between the two world wars. Um, so I came up, I just started writing in the first person um, and I wrote about six pages and they are actually completely unchanged in the first book. So I got her voice right instantly and I sent it off to my agent who said, oh, oh, I love this. Yes. And so we did a bit more and a proposal and sent it off to my publisher who went, no, 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 that wasn't what we wanted at all. So it was put out to bids elsewhere and someone else took it and has been very happy ever since. And, um, and I've been very happy ever since because it's, it's like, um, it's like uh, an extended family. Every time I write a book, it's going back to old friends and old family. You're going to meet all the people you love. You're going to meet granddad and, and Queenie and the dreaded fig and mummy. And, and you wonder what they're going to do next. So there's always something fun to do with her. And, and I find myself thinking, oh, I can't wait until Georgie has to do this. So she's, um, it's interesting because I write the Molly books, which are quite serious and quite dark sometimes. I write these great big World War II books, which are sometimes very dark. And then I write the Royal Spiders where I sit and chuckle. So they're all very therapeutic for each other. Okay, great. Um, one more question from Ravi. Yeah. I love the Victory Garden. Um, was there any real life inspiration for that? Or what, where'd you get your inspiration for that particular title? Um, I think the one thing, the, the one catalyst for that book was that John loves to go to secondhand bookstores and he came back with two books for me on healing herbs, how you can have a garden that has healing herbs in it. Um, and um, at the same time, when I'm in London, my very good friend, Louise Penny, rents a, a flat in Chelsea and she and I go together to the Chelsea Physic Garden. And that's, that's, that's a fantastic place. It was started by monks in like 1400. And every, every area of it, you go around and it says, these are plants that are all good for the heart. These are plants that are all good for the brain. And so, you know, it's, and also of course, there's a poison garden there, which will be part of my next Royal Spinus book. Um, but um, so, so going around a garden like that, I thought, what if there's a person who is so badly damaged um, that she doesn't think she can heal? And she finds she's got a cottage and the garden around it is a healing garden. So that, that was how it got started. Awesome. Well, that's it for questions. Oh, uh -huh. good. Thank you. Well, let me just say, so I know Reese needs to get on with correcting all the things that went wrong with her day. Um, <laughs> we actually, the book is on sale tomorrow, but we have autographed copies from Reese. Very kindly. Yes. Thank you, Reese. Yes. At the bookstore that are, um, yeah, you only have five minutes left for today, but first thing tomorrow morning, you can zip in and pick yours up if you haven't already ordered it. Yeah. We um, are delighted to be able to present it and we'll if needed, have more on yeah. November 4th. And what is the title of the Royal Spinus book for November 4th? It's called The Proof of the Pudding. And if you like books about lovely food, there's a French chef in this whose cooking is divine. Um, uh, you might not want to eat everything he cooks, but most of it is really divine. I say no That's more. Wonderful. <laughs> I was terrified for a moment that Queenie was going to be the show. No, 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 Right. Well, thank you, Reese, for an hour. It was wonderful. Thank you. Our best to John. And I hope that um, the various problems of the day cure themselves. Oh, yeah. A glass of wine will probably cure most things right now. Anyway. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm heading yeah, for yeah. one and I'm sure you are too. Yeah. Enjoy <laughs> your cruise. And I want to hear all about it after. Thank you. I will certainly let you know. Thank yeah. you. And thank and you, thank Jacob. You. And thank you, Jacob. Hour. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.